Dear Director General Raphael Grossi, Executive Director Fatih Berol, and Commissioner Kadri Simpson, dear members of the nuclear community, it's a pleasure to see you all after three years at WNE. Thank you for coming in such large numbers to emphasize major contribution of the nuclear energy to building a low carbon future. I sincerely believe that the global nuclear industry is and must continue to be more than ever one of the answers to the greatest challenge of our century, climate change. The theme chosen for this year's event is the nuclear industry, a key partner for a low carbon society in a responsible future. It resonates with the COP26, which ended a few weeks ago in Glasgow, calling on governments to accelerate the development of low carbon energy sources. In addition, and to illustrate this theme with examples of concrete applications, WNE wanted to highlight three innovative subjects for the future of our industry, SMRs, waste management, and hydrogen. These three subjects will be uh, the uh, subjects of specific panel discussions. You will also find, of course, the best moments which have made WNE such a success since its creation, the sponsors' tribunes, the workshops, the business meetings, the numerous exhibitors' stands, and national pavilions, not forgetting the WNE awards ceremony this afternoon. This year, I also had the pleasure of presenting the first W Fellow Award, a prize that rewards a personality from outside industry who has taken a stand in favor of nuclear energy. Elected by a prestigious jury, chaired by Mr. Bernard Bigot, I'm very pleased to have presented this award to Kirsty Cogan, whom I congratulate once again. Before giving the floor to Raphael Grossi, who is doing us the honor of opening the exhibition, alongside Fatih Birol and Kadri Simpson, and later on, uh, Bruno Le Maire, uh, the, the economy minister of France, I would like to wish you three excellent days of sharing, exchanging, highlighting your solutions, developing your companies, and above all, highlighting everything that makes this industry a key player in our common future. So I welcome you all to this fourth edition of WNE. Thank you very much. And I now give the floor to uh, Raphael uh, Grossi, Director General of IAEA. Mesdames, bonjour. Ladies and gentlemen. Madame la Présidente, merci pour cette invitation. Et c'est un grand plaisir et un grand honneur aussi pour moi d'être là dans ces rendez-vous du nucléaire. Ces rendez-vous du nucléaire qui est si nécessaire qu'est opportun. Nécessaire car nous nous voyons toujours et It is necessary. que vous portez encore aujourd'hui preuve qu'on n'est pas sorti de ces grands défis globaux qui est la pandémie et qui pose et qui nous pose devant la nécessité de donner les réponses nécessaires à nos sociétés, y inclus dans les cadres d'une vraiment nécessaire relance économique. Solution.
global warming and climate change. And we saw how difficult it can be and it is to reconcile global aspirations with local realities and choices that always in politics are hard to make. The good thing is that when we talk about nuclear, when we talk to this community and we talk about what this community does to the rest of the world, we talk about a part, a big part of the solution to the problems we are facing. It's not about ideas, it's not about ideology, it's not about what one may prefer and others may dislike. It's what is already now, as we speak, providing solutions, providing clean energy, a third of the clean energy which is produced today as we speak in this world, and not only in France, which is of course a world leader in terms of a decarbonized or a soon to be decarbonized economy. So this is what nuclear is doing, but we know that we are not yet there and that for these ambitious goals that the international community has set to itself in Glasgow and before that, achieving these goals without nuclear would be far more difficult, if not close to impossible. So it is not something to celebrate. It is a big challenge. It is a big burden on this sector to face this challenge and to provide these solutions. And this is where we also, from the IAEA, come to play in a safe way, in a secure way, in a way that is proliferation resistant. Nuclear is about what we have today, but it is also what our economies will need in the future. We all talk about it and we all expect and have great expectations about the new nuclear and the small and modular reactors which everybody talks about and it's very good. But it's not only that, it is the current fleet that is providing this energy. It is the long-term operation of this fleet that is providing this clean, energy, this clean energy. It is the new build which is so necessary in Europe and in the rest of the world because this is a global debate. And when we look at the world, as tempted as we may be to concentrate our sights in Europe because we are in beautiful Paris, we see how nuclear is already part of the solution without any doubts, without any hesitations. But as I said, the challenge is there for us to make it economically viable, secure, and safe for all. And I'm sure that meetings like this, where we all compare notes and see what the others are doing, are indispensable in getting to this important common goal that we have. But nuclear, and allow me, in this community that is predominantly based on the energy aspect, nuclear is not only that. And I want to say it because nuclear also saves. Nuclear saves lives. Nuclear and the IAEA is deeply engaged in this. Is, and some of you may be surprised, but it is engaged in the fight against, against COVID-19. And it is engaged in the fight against cancer. Yesterday, I had the honor to discuss with President Emmanuel Macron and we will be launching together Rays of Hope, a global campaign to fight cancer in Africa and in the rest of the world. And this is also what nuclear is doing. And this is also what should inspire us 
today. So, Madame la Présidente, quand on célèbre le nucléaire... As we celebrate nuclear, Madam, we talk about an industry, we talk about the science and technologies that are here to stay and provide answers at the time when answers are required indeed. And the IAEA will be working with you hand in hand to get there. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Directeur. Thank you so much, uh, sir, for your highly inspiring uh, speech. Uh, um, Executive Director Fatih Birol. Madam Chair, Mrs. Simpson, uh, Mr. Grossi, Dear Jean Bernard Levy, Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to all of you. International Energy Agency, based in Paris, we look at all energy sources and all energy technologies. We are very fortunate that all energy data is at our fingertips. And as such, we are fortunate that we can detect, highlight, and emerging trends in the energy sector. So today, dear colleagues, I would like to highlight to you one new emerging trend and also would like to share with you a good news. At least we think it's a good news. What is the emerging trend? When we look at the old energy data, new projects, government policies, finance, I can tell you that the nuclear energy is set to make a comeback. Nuclear is coming back. This is very firm on the agenda unless there are some surprises on the government side, on the industrial side. But the general trend is very clear. Politically, economically, and technologically, nuclear is coming back. Why nuclear is coming back? Two reasons. Number one, the recent energy market volatility, high natural gas prices, high electricity prices, making natural gas discussions as part of the geopolitics made many people understand once again that the energy security, electricity security, and the stability of the grids are of golden value. Today in Europe, ladies and gentlemen, natural gas prices are seven times higher than they were only several months ago. The same applies to Asia, Japan, Korea, uh, where those countries are. Huge increase and in the LNG prices, United States and other parts of Asia and the rest of the world. And natural gas industry, I know that there are some colleagues who are working on the natural gas industry here, I can tell you that the nature gas industry, in my view, scored an own goal. Nature gas has been presented to us as a reliable, affordable, and cleaner energy source that will accompany the clean energy transitions. But the recent very high prices and the volatility was not good. And the natural gas industry did not get good marks from millions of consumers around the world. And as such, I believe it made governments, decision makers, give a second thought to alternatives. One of them uh, is here, uh, uh, nuclear power. So nuclear uh, 
security stability is definitely of uh, value, which is one of the drivers of nuclear comeback. The second driver, I think my colleague uh, Rafael mentioned uh, very clearly the role of nuclear in the fight against climate change. We all know, ladies and gentlemen, about 80% of the emissions causing climate change comes from the energy sector. And many of you may know that the International Energy Agency last May made the roadmap of the global energy sector, how to bring the emissions today from 35 gigatons to zero by 2050 to keep the temperature 1.5 degrees Celsius maximum. It is, this report has been accepted by everybody, governments, green, red, blue, whatever it is, institution, institutional investors, companies. And when you look at that roadmap, and in fact, when you look at the thoughts of everybody who wants to fight against climate change, one of the themes is very, very clear. If we want to have a cleaner future, a future which is going to provide a livable planet in the future, we have to see electricity has a big share. In other words, future is electric. Electric in the transportation sector, cars, trucks, electric in industry, and electric in households from heating to others. According to our numbers, in the last 10 years, the world, entire world, each year added about 250 gigawatts of new capacity. 250 in the last 10 years on average, each year 250. And to be in line with the 1.5 degrees, this should increase to 850 each year. The world has to build 850 gigawatts of a power capacity each year from the 250 what we are doing now. And where will this come from? If we want to reach our climate goals, together with our energy goals, it needs to come from renewables, nuclear power, and other clean electricity sources. Nuclear power should be, in our view, working together with renewables. Renewables are, again in our roadmap, will have the lion's share of the growth of electricity uh, capacity growth with the decreasing uh, costs, with the ability being uh, flexible, especially solar, but also uh, wind as well. But we think from a security point of view, dispatchability point of view, it is important to have the uh, nuclear together with renewables in the countries where it is accepted. Now, these are the two drivers, dear colleagues, the energy security, the affordability of uh, energy markets and the climate change for the nuclear to set to make a comeback. But it is not a done deal. There are homeworks for governments and also for the industry. For the governments, I see the immediate job for governments in many countries, especially in the developed part of the world, is the lifetime extension of the existing nuclear power plants. Dear colleagues, lifetime extension of nuclear power plants is today, in most countries, the cheapest source of clean electricity generation. This is in the United States, this is in Europe, this is in Japan and elsewhere. This is the first uh, uh, job. And here, I would like to congratulate the French uh, government with the, uh, the, the vision of uh, Plan 2030 for putting emphasis on uh, nuclear, but also on uh, hydrogen uh, as well. But also, in addition to government, the industry, industry, nuclear industry, must deliver on time and on budget. And this is if the nuclear industry believes the conditions, energy market conditions and climate conditions are so perfect 
that uh, they have to just sit back and relax and everything will come. This is completely wrong. Nuclear industry has to uh, deliver, improving its uh, productivity, bring the cost down, and operating uh, much more uh, efficiently. And uh, here, of course, in addition to the existing large-scale uh, nuclear power plants, the small model reactors are an op important opportunity in order to uh, make sure that the, the construction times, flexibility, and the cost issues are uh, addressed in certain cases. So this is how we see the general the perspective of uh, nuclear in the global energy and climate debate. Now here, uh, my, uh, if I may, my uh, good news is the following. As many of you know, when uh, we make a, a report, it brings a lot of uh, echo and shapes the international energy debate for the investors, governments, and others. So I have announced, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, last uh, week, that the International Energy Agency will come up next May with a major report on the role of uh, nuclear uh, to reach our net zero goals while ensuring the electricity security. We will look at the future of uh, nuclear industry with an emphasis also to uh, SMRs and working with several governments, developed and developing uh, governments, the uh, uh, companies, international organizations, as well as the academia and the civil society, and want to bring a fundamentals and facilitate the nuclear to make a comeback and don't go back again. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Fatih Birol, for your strong message. Uh, nuclear is coming back. I'm uh, sure that everybody in this room uh, has been have been, uh, happy to hear that. And now I give the floor to Kadri Simpson, uh, EU Commissioner for Energy. Dear Ambassador, Dear Ambassador Perman, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, good morning. I'm very happy to join you today at the opening of the World Nuclear Exhibition. It's my first time here, and I was told um, this is the first time a European commissioner has ever spoken at the exhibition. Uh, true, the European Union is uh, neutral towards the different te energy technologies, but uh, this means being attentive um, and um, um, contribution of um, each energy source can bring towards achieving our overarching goal, uh, a decarbonized, uh, fully integrated and more secure energy system by 2050. And this includes nuclear. So I am grateful to Ambassador Berman for this invitation to the exhibition because uh, this is the place where all the players of the nuclear sector value chain meet to discuss innovation challenges, technological trends, market outlook. And this gives me an opportunity to share with you uh, and the other panelists how I see the role of nuclear energy in the EU energy system in the future. I want to begin with a consider consideration the terms of the conversation around nuclear energy in Europe are changing. This shift is due, in my view, to three factors. First and most prominently, the challenge of our fight against changing climate. The energy transition will be one of the biggest deciding factors for reducing global warming to below 1.5 degrees. And this year's COP26 summit in Glasgow has shown us that this remains within reach, but also how steep the road towards decarbonizing the energy system remains. The European Commission has made it clear that uh, the backbone of the future carbon-free European energy power system will be predominantly renewables, 
Together, the member states have committed to a reduction of at least 55% of emissions by 2030, and the EU aims to have at least 40% of renewables in its energy system by the same date. And by 2030, 65% of electricity must come from renewables, the cheapest, the cleanest, domestically produced source of electricity. But moving towards a growing share of intermittent production of energy brings challenges, and the challenge of deploying renewables massively to get to net zero, uh, the challenge of variability, the challenge of storage. There is a growing sense of realism about the need for complementing renewables with baseload base electricity production, and this leads to a renewed interest for nuclear energy as part of the new energy's future. The point is that right now, nuclear power is, is the most prevalent low-carbon source providing the baseload needed for the stability of the electricity grid, and also one that helps reduce reliance of imported fossil fuels, contributing to energy stability and security. In our central scenarios, we foresee roughly a 15% share of nuclear across EU countries in 2050. The second factor is the rapid technological innovation. Technological breakthroughs are bringing new solutions to old and apparently intractable problems from waste disposal in deep underground storage to smaller scale installations that reduce the issues concerning location, long completion time and huge capital intensity of the classic nuclear installations. There is also a new momentum behind the research on nuclear fusion with both public and private funded projects emerging. Third factor, nuclear response to the challenge of growth and competi competitiveness. According to industry reports covering the then 28 EU member states in 2019, the nuclear sector direct directly employed over 350,000 people. Indirectly, it supported over one million jobs, and over half a million of those were classed as highly skilled. We are talking about an impact of over 500 billion euros on GDP, and the estimates show that by 2050, the industry could grow to support more than 1.3 million jobs annually in the currently planned um, investments, if these are realized. Europe is also a leader in some technological segments and could export these technologies abroad. Taken together, growth, innovation, and the net zero goals are putting nuclear energy back to the center of the discussion on the energy transition. I have outlined uh, some of the factors that are changing in the current public conversation, the balance between disadvantages and benefits of nuclear energy. But uh, if this is true, also the way the European Union itself looks at the nuclear energy needs to evolve. Our policies also need to lean into this shift. Safety is a word that immediately comes to mind when we think of nuclear in the European Union, and for good reason. I believe this must and will always remain a priority part of the Union's nuclear policy. As long as almost half of our member states chose to use nuclear energy, the Commission's role is to ensure that this is done in a way that ensures the highest standards of nuclear safety, the highest standards of radiological protection for the workers and the public, and the appropriate treatment of radioactive waste in the medium and long run. We have one of the world's most advantaged legal frameworks rooted in the Euratom Treaty, which must continue to evolve to remain fully fit for purpose. Nuclear safety is also the key objective of the fission part of the Euratom research and training program, mobilizing around 150 million euros a year in direct and indirect actions. For this round of programs, we expect to found around 30 European collaborative projects that will start mid-2022. The program also supports research into the safety and licensing of SMR technologies with a budget of 16 million euros. Some of the best minds can focus on this issue of paramount importance and we are going to see more projects in the years ahead. Euratom is also expanding research into non-power applications of ionizing radiation, in particular medical applications, very important for our fight against cancer. It is strengthening the activities in education, training, and access to research infrastructures. 
with a total budget of 1.4 billion euros between 2021 and 2025. In parallel, it is uh, to its commitment to nuclear safety at home and abroad, the European Union should stand strongly behind the development of innovation and research. So more small modular reactors are a great example. Global interest in these technologies is on the rise. In Europe, industry is responding to this emerging demand with several EU designs already under development. And we are providing backing with our EU research and innovation framework program Horizon Europe. This support is only part of the puzzle. If we want to successfully deploy SMRs, we need to establish the supply chain to sustain it. And I know that many of you in the audience today are the technological champions who will be a vital links in this chain. Because uh, you are aware of the European potential in SMRs, and we are supporting initiatives like the European SMR partnership. This is a way to work with uh, everyone involved, industry, researchers, customers, and national authorities to develop the best regulatory approaches possible for SMR licensing. And next year can be an important year to turn a vision into a concrete partnership. We should also continue to support global co collaboration on disruptive innovations. And here I'm talking about nuclear fusion technologies. Of course, I have to mention ITER. As a international endeavor, it is unique, a first of its kind, a joint project to build the world's largest fusion machine. France's contribution to this global undertaking has been crucial as hosts and as providers of know-how and resources. And during my visit to this uh, site in Kadarash a few months ago, it was good to see the project advancing. I know that we hope to start the full fusion power operation on uh, 2035. And uh, in the meantime, the benefit for international scientific collaboration and the potential spillover effect for technological innovation is hugely significant. And the third area where developments are calling for a gear shift is on investment. Today, the average age of the EU nuclear fleet exceeds 30 years. And according to our analysis, without immediate investments, around 90% of the existing reactors would be shut down around the time when they will be mostly needed in 2030s. So extending their lifetime safely requires between 45 to 50 billion euros. And to keep roughly the same nuclear generation capacity as today, more than 10 member states are planning about 400 billion euros in investment for new capacity installed by 2050. These are significant investments and the cost of financing will play a key role in making nuclear energy production possible and competitive. And that's why the discussions surrounding the inclusion of nuclear in the EU at taxonomy is so important and so polarized. The credibility of the assessment leading to the inclusion also in a transitional form or exclusion of nuclear from the activities eligible under the taxonomy regulation is of key importance and that's why we have put in place a robust process to be in position to make a science-based decision. And the proposal for a second delegated act will be ready in the coming weeks, as President uh, Ursula von der Leyen indicated at the October European Council. And it will clarify whether or not nuclear energy generation, waste disposal and fuel supply can be classified as sustainable activities for investors. And the certainty on this point will help chart the way forward for many of you in the industry at a key point in time when investments are being considered. Ladies and gentlemen, these are my views on the road ahead for the nuclear energy sector. The next years will see important structural changes in this sector. And if EU member states wish to continue to rely on this energy source and exploit its remarkable potential for low carbon energy generation, including for hydrogen production, for instance, uh, if industry wants to live up to these new expectations around nuclear, everyone has to evolve, invest, change, while remaining vigilant on safety. This is the challenge I see ahead of us, and I look forward to continuing our dialogue and working together over the next months and years of my mandate. Thank you very much for listening.
Thank you, Kadri Simpson. Bruno Le Maire is coming over with Sylvie Berman. And now, a recorded video message from Thierry Breton, the European Commissioner for the Internal Market. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, let me thank and Mrs. Berman, President Berman, for having me to this fourth edition of World Nuclear Exhibition. And I'd like to apologize for not being to attend this uh, gathering today. The World Nuclear Exhibition usually presents uh, the whole uh, value chain with the latest uh, disruptive innovations and trends from the market. Uh, this year's edition has probably never been that uh, 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 most ex expected. I've said it repeatedly in the past, the COVID pandemic and consequences has only just confirmed this. We are at the heart of a, a race, global race for a technological leadership where controlling state-of-the-art technologies, uh, 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 supercalculate uh, space connectivity, green hydrogen, IA, or uh, long uh, life cycle energy storage are a prerequisite to the further development of our resilience. It is therefore essential to understand and to act on what the situation implies for us all as Europeans. First of all, we have to uh, have our voice heard on the international stage for our future, uh, prosperous future. Uh, civil nuclear energy is part of the search for autonomy. Secondly, we have to accelerate and anticipate on our green and digital transformation. Here again, nuclear can and must play a central role. I'll come back to this in a moment. About expressing ourselves even more, it is a simple objective, in fact. Europe is an open continent, of course, that makes the most of trade exchanges, as it hasn't been the case. It's part of Europe's DNA, but open under our certain conditions. Uh, we also have to strive the right balance uh, if within each industrial key ecosystems. It implies to have stronger international partnerships, but also to further develop our uh, production capacities. So we did for vaccines, we'll be able to do the same elsewhere. That takes me to my second argument. First of all, the, ne the need to accelerate our dual transition. That is a prerequisite to our future resilience. We have to find our strategy with the European Green Deal. Now we have to work on its uh, operational implementation. And we have to be realistic in terms of the resources required to get there. 400 million euro additional investment million will be necessary every single year in the decade to come. That represents a 60% increase in terms of investments in energy systems. Let us not underestimate this challenge representing by such a transfer of, of, of resources. We also foresee a huge increase in, uh, in electrification needs for some sector, like the steel sector, electricity, demand could quadruple by 2015. In such a transition to a neutral, uh, a neutral climate, we have to be able to rely on nuclear energy as a major steady source of decarbonated energy. But nuclear must also be a source of innovation. I'm thinking about the small modular reactors. Europe should also export other avenues like hybrid systems. Uh, opening up to new applications and new markets. I see a huge potential in terms of nuclear energy in for the production of hydrogen that will, of course, be decarbonated, respecting all security standards. This would uh, help create even faster and autonomous hydrogen economy in Europe. This represents an opportunity for job creations, highly qualified job creations, but also a great chance for competitiveness and industrial excellence. Ladies and gentlemen, my point today with you is that the new geopolitical industrial uh, reality demands two major assets from Europe. First of all, 
capacity. Secondly, stability. These two uh, prerequisites are indeed what define the nuclear energy sector. Thank you. And now we're waiting for Bruno Le Maire, who will be there shortly. Thank you. Bruno Le Maire will be there in three minutes. Thank you for your patience.
Thank you for your patience. Bruno Le Maire just arrived and is on his way to the room. And now, please welcome Sylvie Berman and Bruno Le Maire. Bien, bonjour à tous. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Director General Raphael Grossi, dear Fatih Biro, just say one word. The European Commissioner, but I think she had to leave uh, back to Brussels already. Dear friends, it is the second time these five years that I come to the nuclear 
uh, exhibition. I had attended the fair back in 2018 when I was Minister of the Economy for 18 months. Um, back then, I remember, there were few people in the room and people were actually worrying about the future, the nuclear sector. The dominant speech at the time was that uh, nuclear was uh, living its last moments, last year, so to speak, and we had to move away from nuclear. Thank God we came back from uh, this belief and um, we moved away from it. And I can see the number of people attending this uh, meeting today, and I also referred to the battle that we fought to include nuclear in the European taxonomy. And thanks to all this, things have changed dramatically. Uh, with the President of the Republic, we have the same arguments. So I'm here, uh, I came here a second time in 2018 under more favorable conditions to stand for this historical sector, the French nuclear sector, to stand for this uh, excellent sector that represents hundreds of thousands of jobs, uh, skills, and know-how unprecedented in the world, and export capacity that is considerable. And most and foremost, which is the only way to go in order to be carbon neutral by 2050. When I came here, replacing the President of the Republic, but of course conveying his message, I came here to remind you of the ambitions of our government for the nuclear market, for the jobs attached to it, and for its technologies. The French nuclear uh, um, sector is back again. We want to assert our ambitions in this field. It is time to build a sector that has suffered greatly in the, this last year from a lack of knowledge because there wasn't sufficient training, a lack of skills because young people had moved away from the sector, uh, problems in terms of fundings and doubts. Now the time has come to reconquer. Uh, to, 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 to uh, recovery, and it is essential because this nuclear sector, the backbone of our energy sector, it will help us re become carbon neutral by 2050. It doesn't go against, of course, renewable energy. It is a complement to these. And I'd like to insist on the fact that Having the nuclear sector uh, recover doesn't mean to give up on our ambitions in terms of renewable energies. By no means, both are, of course, compatible and necessary. And I'm saying it in front of uh, EDF CEO Jean-Bernard Lévy, who himself had committed to energy transition, who himself massively invests upon requests from the state into renewable energies, still ensuring the future of the nuclear market. We can rely on best class experts on renewables. We may want, together with the President of the Republic, to invest in clean hydrogen and Simultaneously, we also want to uh, see the recovery of the nuclear market. It doesn't go against one another. It is something that is complementary. Uh, renewables and nuclear must go hand in hand, and it is the way France uh, stands out. That's the way we want to design and make important decisions for the 21st century from an energy point of view. It is even more necessary that we have a challenge ahead of us, and all French people understood it. It is the exponential need for electricity in the decades to come. Electricity will be everywhere. And the needs for power will grow exponentially in the years to come. Electricity is used for 5G, for our iPhones, it will be used in planes, batteries, trains, buses, robotics, absolutely everywhere. Our consumption, power consumption will uh, increase dramatically and uh, for usage, uses that are non-negotiable. It is not just to entertain ourselves, but to feed, to heat ourselves, to travel, to uh, have access to drinking.
Monsieur Bruno Le Maire is speaking without a microphone, therefore interpreters cannot hear him. Test, test son, test son, c'est bon, c'est reparti. Lebert is still speaking without a microphone, therefore interpreters cannot hear him. La singularité française sera... We have to keep and make progress about hydrogen. The microphone's off again. We want the European condition, Commission with the President of the Republic, with the Prime Minister, and with the government and majority. We hope that in the following days, nuclear will be considered as a decarbonated energy indispensable to the success of our zero carbon ambition by 2050, enshrined in the European text and the European taxonomy. We are discussing about it with all our partners. It is one of the uh, topics that we are discussing about with the new German government. I am convinced that we can reach a compromise with Germany in the following day so that nuclear will be enshrined in the European taxonomy. A last couple of words. I see employees at the back of the room. And uh, nuclear is not, ju not just an energy. It's just not a technology. It is a guarantee that we will succeed and reach become carbon neutral by 2050. It doesn't mean the condition for reindustrialization of our country. It implies hundreds and thousands of employees, of metal workers, of welders, of engineers, of maintenance technicians who everywhere in France nurture the nuclear sector. We owe to them success. 
and we have to keep our strong ambitions for the nuclear market. Thank you all. And please, next time, I need to have a microphone for 30 minutes. It's always good to be powered. Thank you.